are of uh, the day just to note that we are going live uh, this uh, morning and uh, tomorrow 7 p.m. to be precise we are still going to run this uh, program live on our uh, platform this uh, day we are receiving once again a mighty uh, man of God servant of God in the continent of Africa and uh, also a global evangelical personality in the person of uh, Dr. Abel Damina who is the founder president of the Abel Damina Ministries International, CEO of uh, Kingdom Light um, Network, and a senior pastor of the Power City International, uh, International with headquarters in Uyo, out there in uh, Nigeria, with extension uh, campuses across the globe. One, I'm sure, uh, we also have uh, uh, such in Cameroon. Uh, reason why he was here uh, last year and the year. Uh, before last time, um, we are going to be discussing with him this uh, day on the church. Uh, we also are going to be looking at what is uh, making um, news today. He is trending on so on so many uh, platforms, uh, talking about uh, this uh, what is called a prosperity gospel. What is the true uh, message of our Christ that should be preached unto uh, the people uh, today? So. Uh, we are glad to have you on our platform once again, Dr. Ebe Damina. Mr. Leona, it's so good to see you. Good morning, blessings and great grace to you. Thank you for having me on your platform today. Okay, I will go straight uh, with uh, the first, qu first uh, question uh, to you today. When I announced that uh, I was going to have you on this platform, so, so many persons have written asking for clarifications. They have sent questions, which I hope you're going to answer in the course of uh, the program. There are so many of them, but I will start with you as days go by. We see and watch you on different Platform, social uh, media, and mainstream uh, media uh, being dragged on social media uh, with other men of God on uh, so many things. And um, why should you be dragged uh, alongside other men of God on opposing views of the Bible? You know, um, the Bible is a theology. The theology of the Bible is Christology. The message of Christology is soteriology. Matthew chapter 1, verse 21. The Bible tells us, She shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. So Jesus came to save man from sin. That is the core. That is the focus of the scriptures. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 15, Brother Paul says to Timothy, And that from a child that was known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. So the scriptures carries with it the message of salvation soteriology. Now the reason why there's divergent views and a lot of opposing conflicting positions on scripture, the Bible tells us you do err because you know not the scripture. Now, the first one is ignorance. You see, uh, the Bible, it's, it's, it's a book that was written by 40 authors. 40 authors, three continents, three languages across a period of 1,500 years, which means the Bible has a worldview, it has a language, it has a culture in which it was communicated and written. That is not our culture, it's not our worldview, and it's not our language. So in order for you to be able to what we call interpret the scriptures, you must sit where they sat, hear what they had, travel to our world, and look for verbiage that will give expression in our world to what they were communicating in their world. Unfortunately, English is just about 800 years, therefore English is young, and the verbiage is still growing. That's why you have over 2,800 translations of the same Bible, because of the, the way language is developing and English is growing. Which means, therefore, if you use a Macmillan dictionary or an English dictionary to define biblical words, you will never arrive at the knowledge of the truth because when the Bible was written, the language that was used is not your English language, which means the Bible has its own language. Like I always say, the Bible will say something like, love not the world, not the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Then the same Bible says, go into all the world, and preach the gospel to every creature. The same Bible says, 
friendship with the world is enmity with God. A friend of the world is an enemy of God. Then the Bible tells us, for God so loved the world. So you see that it looks like a contradiction, but it is language, which means in the Greek, there are two words for, for world. is the word aeons and the word cosmos. But in English, there's only one word for world, which limits the, the translation. If you don't know the original, you will think it's a contradiction. But there is aeons and there is cosmos. So when he says, for God so loved the world, he was saying, for God so loved the cosmos. When he says, friendship with the world is enmity with God, it means friendship with the aeons. Aeons means their way of thinking. So a man of God must be able to understand all of this background to be able to effectively interpret scripture. And where a man of God fails to do that, then there will be contradictions here and there, and they will look like there's divergent interpretations to the Bible. But the Bible is, is a very consistent material with only one singular interpretation. It's one book, one message, and it is the message of the Christ. That's why we call the Bible a Christocentric material that carries with it a Christocentric message. So that is why every teaching of the scriptures must come through the lenses of Christ. And if a preacher fails to do that, he will interpret his own thoughts and his own ideology into the Bible, which is what we call exegesis. But what we do is exegesis. And that is why it looks like there's such a contradiction. But there's really no contradiction in the Bible. There's a perfect harmony to all of the scripture when a man of God thoroughly understands how to interpret the scriptures, taking into consideration the background I just gave you in my explanation. Okay. Um, now, where, where, where fundamentally is uh, your problem with what is happening in the church today? Because uh, if persons are dragging or see you as uh, preaching something other than what ought to be preached, it means uh, that you are, are telling uh, the world what others feel is uh, wrong. What is the problem? Sorry, I, I didn't get your question, Mr. Leonard. Yeah, my question is, fundamentally, where, what is wrong with what is being preached uh, today? Because if people are fighting you, it means that you are preaching what they consider are wrong. Where is the problem? Do you think that um, what is preached today is uh, completely at variance with uh, the call or the message that God sent to the world? Well, fundamentally, the problem, one of the major problems is what they call the prosperity gospel. Okay. That's a major problem in the body of Christ, mm. the prosperity gospel. Now, what they call the prosperity gospel is a transactionary gospel, a gospel that says in order for God to bless you, you must give him something. A gospel that says if you pray and for God to answer your prayer, you must sow a seed. A gospel that says if you don't pay tight to God, things will be tight in your life. A gospel that says the weight of your offering determines the level of blessing that will come from God. That gospel is the major problem to the gospel because there is nothing like prosperity gospel. In Romans chapter 1 verse 16, Brother Paul said, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. It is the power of God unto salvation. So the gospel is the gospel of Christ, the message of Christ. It's not the message of prosperity. Secondly, the God we serve, the father of our Lord Jesus Christ, is not a transactional father. He is a loving father. I mean, Mr. Leonard, imagine that you have your own biological children, but before you talk to them, they have to give you some bribe. Before you answer their expectations, they have to give you some little money. What kind of father is that? The Bible tells us, if you that are evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those that ask him? The Bible tells us in Romans chapter 8, verse 32, He that spared not his son, but gave him up for us all, how shall he not also with him freely give us all things? You know? The Pentecostal Charismatic, which is the group I belong to, most of the preachers in the Pentecostal Charismatic, they view the Bible with materialistic lenses. So every scripture they read, they attach it to money. You hear them say something like Psalm 91, $91 for 91 blessing. And that's fraud because there's no such provision in the scriptures. And because a lot of people don't know the Bible, they don't know the scriptures, they are gullible. So some of these men of God with, with hidden agendas 
take advantage of them and rob them. Actually, the late Archbishop Ben Sinida also told us that this materialistic gospel was originated from America. American preachers were looking for how to get money from their members and they didn't know how to do it. So they brought people from Hollywood to come and teach them how to get money out of their members. And they took those, those strategies and sold them through TBN, through their global media to the whole world. And that is why it has become such a major problem. So when you come out and you begin to teach the Bible the way it is supposed to be taught, a lot of these preachers who are making gain from the gospel, who are using the Bible to extort people and to enrich themselves, these pastorpreneurs, these tight mongers, now they will attack you and then they will make you look like you're attacking the body of Christ. But how can you attack the body of Christ when what you're preaching is Christ? That's why Brother Paul will say, I marvel that you are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel, which is not another. He said there are some that will trouble you who will pervert the gospel of Christ. So there's a perversion of the gospel of Christ. Materialistic gospel is a perversion of the gospel of Christ. And that materialistic gospel goes with a lot of shades. In that materialistic gospel, they have what they call breaking of generational causes, where you have to pay to redeem your firstborn, where you have to pay to be able to be free from demons, where you have to sow a seed to be delivered from danger, where you have to sow a seed to get some money. And that shade of the gospel is a very wicked shade of the gospel. The gospel of Christ is free. Jesus said, freely you have received, freely give. So that is where the issue is. That shade of the gospel called materialistic gospel, which is not the gospel. And that is why a lot of preachers who know the truth will have to rise up and begin to defend the gospel of Christ. Because the gospel of Christ is the only gospel that has the power to save man. That is where the issue is. Okay. Um, somebody is writing from Douala here. He says that 75% of his doubt has been cleared by your message, but wants to know where he can get your books out here in the nation's economic capital, Douala, uh, Cameroon. So uh, there are so, so many messages that are coming in and questions uh, to you, uh, Doctor. But I want us to look at our prosperity gospel. You once preached uh, this uh, gospel uh, because um, people don't know. Uh, what caused you to turn you back on this? Well, I, I preached the prosperity gospel because as I grew up in my Christian journey and I began to preach the gospel of Christ in ministry, growing up, of course, you know, as a young minister, you look up to the fathers. You look up to model, role models in ministry. Even though I knew what the truth was, but because I was looking up to role models who seemed successful, I didn't know when I began to compromise and I shifted into the gospel of the materialistic message. We began to raise money, began to preach and raise money. And then we thought that was the gospel. And we were doing it very sincerely. Preaching the tithe, preaching the sowing, preaching about materialism. And let me tell you something else about the background of the materialistic gospel. What they actually call the materialistic gospel is what they call the American dream. The American dream of a basic life. Where before you're successful, you have to have a car, have a house, have some money, you know, and look successful. That's the American dream. So the Americans bring that, brought that dream into Christianity and began to look for Bible verses that were quoted out of context to support that American dream. And they sold it to us, and we bought into it. I bought into it. I was a victim of it. And I preached it with gusto because I believed it was the truth. But as I kept preaching it, the more I, I preached it, the more I got empty. The more I preached it, the more I got empty. The more I knew that there is more to life than just money, car, house, give to get, give to prosper, give to succeed, give to act. I knew that there was more to it. That was not what it should be. But I didn't know what the problem was. And then I got to a point in my ministry where I began to feel empty. I began to feel totally empty and frustrated. And I had to take time away from church because I was no more happy to do ministry. In fact, I thought my ministry had ended. I thought God was just done with me. It was time for me to die because there was no more joy in what I was doing from God what the matter was and while I was praying and seeking the Lord you know I stumbled by Andrew Womack's book Andrew Womack is a preacher in America 
Because I watched him on TV, but I wasn't intrigued by his style of teaching. Because in the materialistic gospel, it's all about hyping people, about exciting people. Because you must massage people emotionally and get them excited to be able to extort money from them. So Andrew Walmart didn't look attractive to me. I was not bothered about what he was saying. It's the style that was my problem. So I got into a book center in America and I, I saw his book. So I bought all of them. I said, if I can't understand what he said, maybe I will understand what he's written. I came back to Nigeria praying. I stayed away from church. I was no more preaching because I was fed up. And then in the course of this, my search, I took one of Andrew Womack's book, actually two of them, on my way from Dubai in the plane. And as I began to read, the missing link in my understanding of the gospel fell in place. Suddenly my eyes were opened. And I read the two books. When I got home, I took time to go back to the Bible, sat down and study. Came to my church, apologized, and told them that materialistic gospel is not the gospel. And I told them all those fundraising and everything was wrong. And I apologized. And I told them, if any of you have decided to leave this church because you can't trust me again, I will not be angry. I will not be angry. But if you can be patient, I will show you where I went wrong and I will show you what the true gospel, what the message of the Bible is. Some of our people stayed back and we began to go through the scriptures and began to teach them Christ, began to show them Christ, began to build them in the knowledge of Christ. And that was how my transition came about. And today I am the better for it. Now there is joy of salvation. Now my joy is not built on material things. My joy is built on the fact that I have a vibrant relationship with God Almighty. And because of that, all over the world today, men are turning to the gospel of Christ. Jesus didn't die to give you a car. Jesus didn't die to give you a house. You can get a house without the death of Christ. You can get a car without the death of Christ. You can make money without the death of Christ. Some of the successful people on earth don't even care about God. But Jesus died to solve a problem. And that is the message of the Bible, a problem that man cannot solve. For all have sinned, and the wages of sin is death. So Jesus came to cure sin. Matthew 121. She shall bring forth a son. Thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. That is why out of the death of Christ, what we have is eternal life. Eternal life. What we have is union with God. The Bible tells us in Romans chapter 4 verse 25, who was delivered for our offenses and was raised again for our justification. Chapter 5 verse 1. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we have access into this grace wherein we stand and rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. So that was how my transition came about. And I'm so glad that all over the world today, men are arriving to see that the truth of the gospel is what can restore man into a vibrant relationship with God. And whatever God gives to man in Christ is freely given. Glory to God. Okay, uh, glory uh, to God. Um, so many persons are not very happy with your gospel. Are you, want, are you bothered? Are you threatened? Are you attacked? And uh, what gives you the courage to move on with uh, something that is considered a, 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 a big uh, trouble to them uh, in, um, in, in, in Nigeria or in Cameroon and across Africa? You know, Mr. Leona, the truth of the matter is, it is not the first time. When Jesus showed up on earth and began to preach the gospel of the kingdom and began to preach the gospel of life, he too was attacked. People called him demon. People called him the Elzebub. People call him a child born out of fornication. People call him all kinds of names. They attack Jesus. So the fact that people are attacking me today means I am in good company. You cannot preach the gospel of Christ without persecution. Persecution goes with the gospel of Christ. It's not only Jesus. Paul the apostle was attacked. In fact, in Acts of the Apostles chapter 2 and 3, when they went out and preached and healed the man at the gate beautiful, the Bible tells us that the, the, the Sanhedrin council took the apostles and beat them up and warned them never to preach in the name of Jesus. And the Bible says when they left, they rejoiced that they were counted worthy to suffer for his name's sake. So it goes with the terrain. That's why Brother Paul was saying in Galatians chapter 1, verse 10, 11, and 12. Do I now please men? For if I please men, I shall not be a servant of Christ. Let me be honest to you, Mr. Leona. There are men of God who know this truth I'm preaching, but they are afraid of persecution. That's why they are not speaking out. They are afraid of being persecuted. 
But how can I know the truth and not preach the truth? One day we will face Jesus. Every preacher will stand before Jesus to give account. You know, some pastors don't know that one day we will see Jesus and we will give account of what we preach. And if a man does not preach the truth, his works will suffer loss. The Bible says his works will be burnt. It is that persuasion and conviction that is driving me to preach the way I preach. I have nothing to protect. I have nothing to hide. The gospel is an open message. It's there in the Bible. If anybody challenges my position, he can go to the Bible and check what I'm preaching word for word. And you will see that that is the truth of the gospel. And so I'm not ashamed of this gospel. I'm not afraid. I'm not bothered. People are attacking me, all kinds of names and videos and all kinds of things just to align my person. You know, religion is such that when you bring a superior argument and they cannot withstand your superior position, they will leave the, 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 the issues and begin to attack persons. It's the way it has always been. But I'm in good company with Christ. I'm in good company with the apostles, and I'm in good company with those who preach the gospel of Christ. People say evil thrive when good people do nothing about it. When there is false doctrine, the society decays. Remember, a false doctrine will produce false believers, and that is why we cannot fold our hands. We must shout. We must scream the truth of the gospel so that people who have hidden agendas will not mutilate the gospel and end up producing false converts and false brethren and endanger the eternity of men with God. Okay. Uh, so many persons are asking where they can have they teach your teachings and um, um, I don't know the campus to follow up. I, I, should I share the number of uh, Pastor Bello with them? Please share our numbers with them. Okay. Okay. I'll do that. Uh, so uh, I will take this one. Good share thing. our numbers with them. Okay. Uh, good morning, Mr. Liu. I'm Reverend Anzo Zela. Uh, repent following from Douala. I wish to ask uh, Dr. Abel a question. What is your perspective on the concept of one saved, forever saved? How does it align with biblical teachings? How do you explain the balance between God's grace and human responsibility in a salvation a process to worship an angels? You mentioned that angels worship God. In the man Christ Jesus. Could you elaborate on this? How does it relate to Hebrews 1 5 6? How can believers depend their understanding or deepen their understanding of angelic worship and its significance? Okay, so uh, first of all, let's begin with one thing forever. Saved. Saved. Yes. Salvation is eternal. Jonah said, Salvation is of the Lord, 100%. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 8 tells us, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. So salvation is the gift of God. It's not of works at all. John 3 16, For God so loved the world, that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life should not perish but have everlasting life romans chapter 10 verse 8 9 and 10 for with the heart man believeth unto righteousness and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation that if you shall believe in your heart the lord jesus and confess with your mouth you shall be saved the book of romans chapter 8 tells us that god is the one that keeps you if God be for us, who can be against us? Who spare not his son? Then he began to talk about what shall separate us from the love of God. And he enumerated a lot of things that can make a person lose salvation. He says, shall nakedness, shall strife, shall hunger, shall things present, things to come, death, life, principalities, powers. He said, I am fully persuaded, neither things in this life or in, th in the life to come shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus. In John chapter 10 verse 28 and 29 Jesus said, I give unto you eternal life and you shall never lose it. You shall never lose it. You can't lose it because salvation is of the Lord. You see, the reason why people think about losing salvation is because they do not understand the background of words. The word salvation is a Greek word soteria. Now, among the Greeks, 
For you to have a soteria, you must have a sota. A sota is the person that provides soteria, which it's like an emperor. When an emperor goes into a territory and conquers the territory, he moves into the territory to be domiciled in that territory. So the word soteria cannot be complete without a sota. It is the sota of soteria that guarantees soteria. So Jesus is like an emperor who died and conquered sin and bought us with a price, his blood, and moved into our hearts to live in our hearts and secure us. That's why the Bible in Ephesians chapter 1 verse 13 and 14 says that you are sealed with the Holy Ghost of promise until the redemption of the purchased possession. You are sealed. That means God has put a stamp on you that you belong to him forever. Hebrews, I mean, Ephesians 1, 13 says, in whom also you trusted, after that you had the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, after that you believed, you were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. Verse 14 of that chapter says, which is the earnest, the down payment, the guarantee of our inheritance, until the redemption of the purchased possession, unto the praise of his glory. So God put his seal on every believer. And Jesus said, I have received commandment from my father, that those that the father has given to me, none is lost. I have a commandment to keep them. So Jesus is the keeper. That's why Paul will say, being confident of this very thing, that he that has started this good work in you of salvation shall be faithful to finish it. But where people have problem, where they keep saying balance, balance. There's nothing like balance. The balance is the truth. The truth is the gospel. You don't balance truth. It is truth because it is balance. Now, there is the finished work of Christ. There is the ongoing work of Christ. Finished and ongoing. So salvation is in three categories. You are saved. You will be saved. You are being saved. You are saved. You are being saved, you will be saved. Now, this is the difference, and this is the explanation. You are saved by the death of Christ. Salvation is eternal. You are saved forever. You are being saved is the renewing of the mind. So that the realities that you have received in your spirit in Christ can be reflected in your lifestyle on earth. So you can enjoy the victory that you have. But whether your mind is renewed or not, you are already saved. The only problem is that if your mind is not renewed, you will not experience the victory that is yours in Christ. Then you will be saved is the redemption of the body. When mortality shall put on immortality. But the reason that one will happen is because you are already saved. So salvation is the work of Christ. The renewing of the mind comes by teaching. But the resurrection of the body, which is called rapture, is going to happen because you are already saved. And you don't lose it because it's not an item on the shelf. Salvation is a fusion of your life with Christ. You don't have life anymore. Christ becomes your life. Bible says when Christ, who is our life, shall appear, we shall appear with him in glory. So Christ is our life. Galatians chapter 1 verse 21, Paul says, I mean verse 20, Paul says, I have been crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ lives in me. The life that I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who, who loved me and gave himself for me. So salvation is eternal, you don't lose it. But once you are saved, you begin to learn the word of God. As you are learning the word of God, the word of God begins to train your mind to align with the realities in your spirit so you can experience victory in this world. And when you die or when you sleep, you sleep in Christ. On the resurrection day, you are quickened by Christ who is in you and your immaterial body swallows your material body. And that is the complete package of salvation. I hope that helps. Yes, I didn't hear the rest of the questions. He talk, he talk, he, he, if you can just he also remind talk, me what else he talked about. Asked. He, he talked about uh, the worship of uh, angels and Christ. Okay, okay. So the worship of angels is what we call angelos treskia. 
Okay. And jealous stress care is using the law of Moses to approach God. Because the law was given by angels, Galatians chapter 3, verse 17 to 19. Galatians chapter 3, verse 17 to 19 explains to us how this law of Moses was given. Remember, before I read Galatians chapter 3, verse 17 to 19, John chapter 1, verse 17 says, The law was given by Moses, but grace, which is the truth, exists as Jesus Christ. So the law is called the law of Moses. Why? Galatians 3, 17 says, And this I say, that the covenant that was confirmed before of God in Christ, the law, the law, which was 430 years after, cannot disannul that covenant of God in Christ. That it should make the promise of God for salvation of none effect. Next verse. The next verse says, For if the inheritance be of the law, it is no more of promise. But God gave it to Abraham by promise. Now the next verse now says, Wherefore then, serve the law of Moses, it was added because of transgression till the seed should come to whom the promise was made and it was ordained by angels in the hand of a mediator angels ordained the law of moses in the hands of moses who made moses a mediator man made moses a mediator so moses gave man a law to keep them since they rejected the gospel of christ so the law is the law of moses so any worship of God using the law of Moses is a worship of angels. It is called angelos trescia. Colossians chapter 2 verse 18 to 20. And I'm going to read that for you right now. Colossians chapter 2 verse number 18 to 20 further explains what the worship of angels is. It says, let no man beguile you of your reward in a voluntary humility and worshiping of angels intruding into those things which he has not seen, vainly, vainly puffed up by his fleshly mind. The next verse now says, I'm not holding Christ. So when you are in the worship of the law of Moses, you are not holding Christ. It says, not holding the head from which all the body by joints and bands have nourishment ministered and knit together, increase it with the increase of God. Verse 20 of it now says, wherefore, if you be dead with Christ from the rudiments of the world, why as though living in the world are ye subject to ordinances? That's what the Lord teaches, ordinances. The next verse says, ordinances like touch not, taste not, handle not. If you don't do like this, you cannot qualify, which are all to perish with the using. Then he calls it the commandments and doctrines of men. Then he now goes further to say, which things have indeed a show of wisdom in will worship and humility and neglecting of the body, not in any honor to the satisfying of the flesh. So when people are engaged in all kinds of things, they are in angel worship. That's why chapter 3 verse 1 of Colossians now says, if ye then be risen with Christ, instead of using olive oil to approach God, mantle, handkerchief to approach God, holy water to approach God, and all those things. It says, if you then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Oh, glory to God. So, angel worship is actually using the law of Moses as a standard to approach God. That's why Romans chapter 10 verse 4, Romans 10 4 says, Christ is the end of the law for righteousness. Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believes. Romans chapter 10 verse 4. The Romans chapter 8 verse 3 now says, For what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin condemned sin in the flesh. Verse 4 says that the righteousness of God may be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. The worship of God today is in spirit, not in the letters of the law. For the law killeth, but the spirit giveth life. We worship God in spirit. That is the truth. We don't worship God in elements. We don't worship God in things and stuff. The worship of God today is in Christ. Philippians 3.3 3 says, we are the circumcision that worship 
God in the spirit and have no confidence in the flesh. I hope that helps. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Uh, CGFI is watching us uh, from Yaoundé, the nation's capital. Mfon Genevieve is also watching us from Yaoundé. Barry Boyu is watching us from Bermenda. Josephine Diu is watching us from Kambe, Dungamantu Division. Uh, Benny Azenu is watching us from Douala here, Bonaberry to be precise. And Gala Kaleb is watching us from um, Kambe, Dungamantu. Kenya Javsen is watching us from Bankolo in Yaoundé. Uh, uh, Herbert Nkunye is, uh, okay, is in Bafusam. Mekongo uh, Vitalis is watching us from Mundimbanzian Division, Southwest Region. Silas Ngemkong is watching us from Douala here. Uh, so many persons are writing to get clarifications on this issue of tithing and uh, first fruit. They say it is written in the Bible. Why do you have problems with it? Well, again, when we talk about the tithe, the word tithe means tenth. The word tithe means tenth. So what is the origin of that word tithe? The tithe started with Abraham in Genesis chapter 14 when he went to the slaughter of the kings. That's where the word tithe started from. Genesis chapter 14. When Abraham went to recover Lot, and the Bible tells us that when he went to that war, he defeated his enemies and recovered Lot and came back with the spoil of war. He came back with the spoil of war. And upon his return, he met a man called Melchizedek. When Abraham saw Melchizedek, Melchizedek looked at Abraham, who was a type of Jesus, because the Old Testament is types and shadows, prophecies and promises. When he saw him, Abraham was spoken to by Melchizedek. Melchizedek said, Blessed be Abraham of the Most High God, the possessor of heaven and earth. And Abraham gave to Melchizedek a tithe. Nobody asked Abraham. It was their culture. It was in their tradition. And don't forget, Abraham was an idol worshiper. And in idol worship, you don't go to the deities empty-handed. You must always come with a red fowl or a white chicken or a blue chicken or something to approach the deities in idol worship. Abraham was a worshiper of the sun and the moon. So you already had that background. And then it was in their culture that when you meet the deities, you cannot meet them empty-handed. So that is where the origin of the tithe started from. Then under the law of Moses in Exodus chapter 19 verse 4, God said to Moses, tell Israel to come up to the mountain. I want to make them a kingdom of priests and kings. I want to interact with them directly. And the children of Israel told Moses to tell God they don't want to talk to God. If God wants to say anything to them, he should talk to Moses. Moses will talk to them. If they want to talk to God, they will talk to Moses. Moses will talk to God. So they appointed Moses their mediator. So Moses now gave them the gospel. They rejected the gospel. And when you reject the gospel, you have decided to live a life that is callous. So Moses decided to give them 613 laws to govern the nation of Israel. Moses was like their president. He gave them moral laws. He gave them all kinds of laws to govern them. And if you break one of those laws, you break all. You'll be punished. Moses knew that none of them could keep those laws. So he set up for them what we call a Levitical priesthood. It was a priesthood that was to attend to the things of the temple on behalf of the children of Israel. So a tribe in Israel was set aside out of the 12 tribes. They are called the Levites. That's why it's called Levitical priesthood. Now, the Levites did not have to get any secular work. They were to stay in the temple and serve the temple and offer sacrifices on behalf of Israel. So Moses now said, because the Levites will not have any job, every Israelite must pay tithe to the Levites. It became a law to pay the tithe. But watch, the tithe was always from animal produce, from farm produce, from harvest. And they were to do it every year when they have harvest so that there can be food for the Levites to eat. There can be food for the orphans to eat. There can be food for the strangers to eat. So that was how the law of tithing became a law in Israel. In Malachi chapter 3, which is often quoted by pastors, where they will say, if you don't pay your tithe, it will be tight. If you don't pay your tithe, the virus will come. Actually, Malachi chapter 3 was not to the Israelite. It was to the priest. If you open...
We hope he gets uh, sorted out as soon as possible. Okay. Um, we have. Um, we hope that that connection gets fixed so that we continue with the program with uh, Dr. Um, and purifier of silver, and it shall purify the sons of. Ella, certainly we have some issues there. We're supposed to do okay. what Jesus never did, we are not supposed to do. Ephesians tells us that the church is built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets. Jesus himself, the cornerstone, which means it's apostolic and historic. Jesus never paid tithe. Jesus never received tithe. The apostles never paid tithe. The apostles. Um, we're going to certainly take a break. Can we take a break, uh, Eli? In response to the goodness of God, in response to what God has done. Now, when you talk about first fruit, the first fruit was a feast of Jewish people that Moses gave to Israel. Why were they to celebrate the first fruit? Because the first fruit was a message concerning Christ. Jesus today is our Passover. Jesus is our first fruit from the dead. Is our first fruit from the dead. So first fruit is not money. First fruit. Oof. My gosh. Abel Damina Ministries International, if you go there, just look for tight and tighten. It's about 14, 15 hours of teaching. From Genesis to Revelation, I unpack that whole thing with sound exegesis. I hope that helps a bit. Um, yeah, I hope we actually helps and that the message is uh, gone through we are facing some issues with the uh, network uh, here the podcast is not really fluent uh, especially for this last explanation um eli can we take a short break to get things fixed um.
Yeah, we are back. We're sorry for that technical hitch. If Dr. Abel Damina is there, can... Doctor, are you there? Yes, I'm here. I'm here, Mr. Yeah. Leona. Yeah, we had um, a small technical issue with your explanations on tight and uh, fast food. Can you just come back to it very briefly? Three minutes, please. Tight and fast food. Yes, we had some issues with it. All right, so, like I said, when we talk about tight, we are talking about the tent. Tight means tent, all right? So if it is not tent, it is not tight. It has to be 10%. But where did it start from? What's the origin of the tithe? The origin of the tithe was in Genesis chapter 14. When Abraham went to the slaughter of the kings, he went to war and was able to recover Lot and all the spoil of war. On his return, he met Melchizedek. When Melchizedek saw Abraham, he said, Blessed be Abraham of the Most High. And Abraham gave Melchizedek a tithe of all. He didn't pay. He gave that was his generosity. Where did Abraham got, get that from? First of all, it was in their culture that when you approach deity, you have to come with something. Number two, Abraham was an idol worshiper. And in idol worship, you don't approach deity empty-handed. In Africa, we know that when you're going to a deity or an idol or, or a native doctor, you go either with a red chicken, red fowl, or those kind of things. So Abraham just did that culturally and did it based on his background in idol worship. Now, but remember nobody asked him he just did it in response to the blessing that was pronounced on him not as a prerequisite for blessing but in response then under the law of moses in exodus chapter 19 god said to moses tell israel to come up to the mountain i want to make them a kingdom of priests and kings israel said we don't want god if we want to talk to god we will talk to moses if moses if god wants to talk to us let him talk through moses so moses became a mediator between god and israel because of that Moses now decided to give them 613 laws. It's called the law of Moses to govern Israel. There were moral laws and all of that. And then because of that, he set up for them a Levitical priesthood. Levites were supposed to serve in the temple. They will not have business or jobs. And if, because of that, Moses now made it a law in Israel that everybody will have to pay tithe so that the Levites are sustained. But the tithe was going to come from farm produce. It was going to come yearly from farm produce so that there can be food for the Levites, food for the orphans, food for the poor, and food for the strangers. And it was a lot throughout the Old Testament. Now, so when Jesus came, Jesus abolished the law of Moses. The Bible says Christ came to fulfill. Fulfill means to meet the demands of the law. That's why Romans chapter 10 verse 4 says Christ is the end of the law for righteousness. Now, remember, Christianity is apostolic and historic. That means what the apostles never did and what Jesus never did, we are not supposed to do. So in the New Testament, nobody paid tithe. Jesus never paid tithe. Jesus never received tithe. The apostles never paid tithe. The apostles never received tithe. In the book of Acts, where the New Testament church started, which we belong to, they started with generosity. People gave freely to support the work, to support the poor in their midst. That is New Testament giving. Now, somebody say, if I don't pay tithe, will I not be cost? There's no cost. You don't owe God anything. You only give to support the work of God as a responsible child of God. Giving is in our nature. And that's why God loves a cheerful giver. The Bible says, if a man gives according to what he has, it is acceptable. That is New Testament giving. So, tithing has been taken away. What about first fruit? First fruit was a feast in Israel. Moses gave it to the children of Israel to communicate Christ to them. All the feast was to communicate Christ. They rejected the gospel. So Moses gave them a feast. But the first fruit today is Jesus. Jesus is our first fruit of resurrection from the dead. First fruit is not your general salary. It is Jesus' resurrection. Somebody said, but if I decide to give my pastor my general salary, that's your decision. But it doesn't have a special blessing. You just decided to honor your pastor with your general salary. Like you could have given it to your parents or you could have eaten it. It doesn't make any difference. We don't give to get from God. We give in response to what God has already done. That is how the New Testament operates. So tithing is done with in the Old Testament. But there are lessons we learn from the tithe, which is generosity, which is giving. Because Romans chapter 15 verse 4 tells us, What things soever were written aforetime, they were written for our learning, that we through patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. So in the New Testament, we give 
and we give generously to support the work of God, to help the brethren, and to help the poor. That is New Testament. I hope that helps a bit. But I have a full teaching on tight and tighten on YouTube. My channel is Abel Damina Ministries International. If you go there and type tight and tighten, about 14 hours of total unpacking of the concept of tithe and first fruits in the scriptures. Okay. I hope it helps. Yeah, okay. Um, Jude Zilla, Repent Suika is watching us from Douala. Lovely in Kenya is watching us from Bunaberi, Douala. Uh, Barry Boyu is uh, watching us from Bumenda. Okay. Um, Sama Rich is watching us from Gaundiri, Adamawa uh, region there. And uh, Safe Dominique Fongam is watching us from Bonaberry. Um, Bongwi Remedy is watching us from Adamawa region. That's in Adamawa uh, in Gaundiri. Bestie Best is watching us from Yaoundi. Uh, Viva Run says, uh, I'm watching you guys uh, from. Uh, Cameroon, okay. Manka Odette is watching us from Ndokpasi out here in uh, Douala. Um, we uh, let's talk about this. What is uh, also uh, trending today? The prophetic uh, ministry, uh, prophetic uh, declarations. How does it help? Is it uh, in fulfillment of what the I don't know? The Bible says that um, later in in these times, I'm sure later times uh, we're going to dream dreams and see visions. Well, again, Christianity is historic and apostolic. Okay. That means what the apostles of the Lamb never did, what Jesus never did, we are not supposed to do. The Bible tells us that the church of Jesus is the pillar and the ground of the truth, is the mainstay of the truth. If you observe in the apostolic writings, in the scriptures, the scriptures are replete with teaching, teaching, teaching. When all a church does is prophetic declaration, you will make it. You will get there. It will be well with you. They are good, but they are not the core message of the church. And it's like feeding people snacks. They will never grow. They will be malnourished. They will have spiritual kwashoko. They will never be enriched. That's why if you observe Jesus, the model of ministry, everywhere he went, he was teaching, teaching sound doctrine. When he takes unbelievers to the bush, he will teach them for three days. Three days of Bible teaching. It's not I declare, I pronounce, I declare. No, teaching. Teaching means to do exegesis, to take the scriptures and bring Christ from the scriptures and feed believers with it. You cannot substitute sound Bible teaching with prophetic declarations. No, you cannot. Because people will not grow, people will not be matured. And some of those declarations are just mere wishes of men. They don't have sound Bible backing. And that's why a child of God must prize Bible teaching above everything else. Because it is in sound Bible teaching that you will know Christ. And until you know Christ, you cannot know yourself. It is the revelation of Jesus that unveils the identity of the believer. If you don't know Christ, you cannot know yourself. That's why Colossians chapter 2 verse 6, and I'm going to read that for you. Colossians chapter 2 verse 6 says, As you have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in him. How did you receive Christ Jesus the Lord? I'm going to read verse 7 and 8. How did you receive Jesus Christ the Lord? It says, For by grace are you saved through faith. You receive Christ Jesus by grace through faith. How do you walk in him? By grace through faith. He said, Rooted and built up in him and established in the faith as you have been taught. You can't play with sound Bible teaching in a church. If all a church is doing is prayer, 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 it's like a shrine. If all a church is doing is prophecy, 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 throw people on the ground, that is like a shrine. The real assignment of the church is teaching, teaching, teaching. Ephesians chapter 4 verse 12 says, for the perfecting of the saints to do the work of ministry, that the body of Christ may be edified. That we henceforth be no more tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the sly of men and cunning craftiness, whereby they lie in wait to deceive. So the church has a mainstay, and that is to dispense Christ, to get people rooted, grounded, established in the knowledge of Christ as you have been taught. Then he says, beware, in verse 8, lest any man spoil you through vain philosophy, idle fancies, 
and not after Christ. When you, all you are hearing is sweet, sweet talk, you will make it. You will get there. Somebody is foiling you. Somebody is taking advantage of you. You will not grow like that. That's why it says, beware, lest any man spoil you. Paul said, when I came to you, I didn't come with enticing words of men's wisdom, motivational speaking. I didn't come. He said, but I came in the demonstration of power, that your faith should not rest in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. You cannot substitute sound Bible teaching for prophetic declarations and all of those things. It's very critical because we're living in times where you must desire the sincere milk of the world that you may grow thereby. You must prize spiritual growth above everything else. And that is the mission of the church on the earth today. Uh, let's look at uh, the revelation of uh, Christ. How much should it be taught in uh, the church uh, today? I'm talking about the book of uh, Revelations. Do you believe that uh, we have a full mastery and understanding of what this book is all about? Well, are you talking about the message of Christ? How much should it be taught in the church? No, I'm talking the book of Revelation. I don't know. That's the revelation of Christ. Um, I'm sure written... Yes. Yeah. That's... That should be, Mr. Learner, that should be the main message. Mm -hmm. Let's look at how it started. Since Christianity is his, historic and apostolic, mm -hmm. what were the messages preached in the early church? What were the first set of messages? In Acts chapter 2 on the day of Pentecost, Peter preached Christ died. He was buried. On the third day, he rose again. In Acts chapter 4, which was the second message, Peter preached Christ died. He was buried. On the third day, he rose again. The third message in Acts chapter 5, verse 42, it says, Daily in the temple and from house to house, they cease not to preach and teach Christ. Then in the book of Acts chapter 8, verse 5, fourth message, Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ. In Acts chapter 9, talking about uh, Peter in the house of Cornelius, he preached Christ died, he was buried, on the third day, he rose again. And while he spoke, the Holy Ghost fell on the audience. The fifth message of the New Testament church in Acts of the Apostles. The Bible tells us in Acts chapter 13, when brother Paul came, he preached Christ. The preaching of Christ is the mainstay. That's what we hear every time we gather. We preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord. If all the church is always preaching is money, you will make it, material success, keys to success, keys to favor. Just know that you are in the wrong place. You are feeding on the wrong diet. The diet must always be the gospel. Now, what is the gospel? 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 1 to 4. I'm going to read it for you. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 1 to 4. That's what Paul will say in Romans 1, 16. I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. It is the power of God unto salvation. So the gospel is the message of Christ. In 1 Corinthians 15 verse 1, Paul was speaking to the church in Corinth. He said, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preach unto you, which also you have received, and wherein you stand. Verse 2 says, By which also you are saved. If you keep in memory what I, I preach unto you, unless you have believed in vain. What is the gospel? Next verse. For I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received. How that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. And that he was buried. And that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. That is the mainstay. That is what we assemble to learn. Christ, Christ, Christ. Because the more you see Christ, the more you see yourself. The more you see yourself. The more you know the purpose of God for your life, the more you are empowered to live a victorious life. That's why Paul will say, we all, with open face, beholding the glory of God as in a mirror, we are changed into that same image, from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of God. And listen carefully. When Christ is continually preached in our churches, the Holy Spirit will keep bearing witness. Because the Holy Ghost is here to bear witness of Christ. It is not Christ. It is not the gospel. If it, if, if people may be falling down. If it is not Christ, it is not the gospel. The gospel is Christ and him crucified. And that's what we hear all the time. That's what we should hear all the time. 
If that is not being fed you all the time, you are not in a church. You are in a social club. A real church of Jesus will dwell on the message of the Christ all the time. Okay. Uh, Dr. Ebel, let's look at um, the, this issue of uh, deliverance in uh, churches. We have persons who are delivered five times in the church. Is it that uh, as the, the, the body is cleaned, the spirits come and fill it, and once they appear in church, they are delivered all the time? Or well, how does it operate? Do you do deliverance in your church? Well, first of all, well, first of all, what is deliverance? Deliverance is salvation. Mm. Is the word aphesis. Aphesis. Deliverance. Salvation. That's why Colossians chapter 1, verse 12 says, Give him thanks unto the Father. Who has made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light. Verse 13 now says, Who hath delivered? We are already delivered. Who hath delivered? The believer doesn't need deliverance. The, the believer was delivered when he got born again. So anybody doing deliverance from you for you after salvation is robbing you of your reality in Christ. He's taking advantage of your ignorance and illiteracy. You know, somebody say, if you say education is expensive, try ignorance. Ignorance is very, very expensive. A believer cannot be looking for deliverance. Deliverance is what happened to you the day you were born again. So salvation is deliverance. So now, but the problem many preachers have is they don't even know that there is a difference between deliverance and casting out devils. To cast out devils means to expel unclean spirits. Every child of God ought to be casting out devils. The Bible says, this sign shall follow those that believe. In my name they shall cast out devils. He didn't say, in my name they shall have devils cast out of them. They are the ones to cast out devils. But when you are in a church where a pastor wants to keep robbing you and taking advantage of you, he will be creating for you a false narrative. He will tell you if you are dreaming and they pursue you in your dream, you need deliverance. If you eat in your dream, you need deliverance. If you're having sex in your dream, you need deliverance. In kibbutz and si kibbutz, all that is old wife fables. The reason why you're having sex in your dream is because you're feeding your subconscious mind with a lot of illicit materials. If you're not doing it now, you might have done it before. So what you need is not deliverance. What you need is a renewing of your mind, which is a product of teaching. If you eat in the dream, ask for more. Ask them to bring more food. There's nothing wrong in eating with the dream. In the dream, after all, that prepares a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Remember, whom the son sets free is free indeed. This freedom you receive was the day you got born again. That's why the book of Galatians 5 1 says, Stand fast in the liberty wherewith Christ has set you free, and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Galatians 5.1 be not entangled don't let anybody spoil you don't let anybody take advantage of you after salvation you don't need deliverance what you need is spiritual growth the more you learn the word of god the more your mind is renewed it is called the washing of water by the word he didn't say believers shall have demons cast out of them it is believers that will cast demons out of people christ and satan cannot dwell in the same body just like light and darkness cannot stay in the same place so once you receive Christ, Satan is out. He's out. The only thing now you need is knowledge. That's why Paul prayed that the eyes of your understanding be enlightened, that you may know what you have received when you receive Christ. So that teaching of deliverance is a fallacy for believers. But somebody will say, what about Obadiah 117? Upon Mount Zion there shall be deliverance. He didn't say deliverance shall be done in Zion. It is the word peleta. Peleta means the delivered ones shall assemble in Zion. Zion is the assembly of those that are delivered from darkness to the light. That's why Brother Peter would say, he has called you out of darkness, that salvation, into his marvelous light. You that were not a Lord. people are now the Lord. people of God. You can't have Christ and they're doing you deliverance. Are they casting out Christ or who are they casting out? You have Christ already in you. You are secured in Christ. You don't need deliverance anymore. Don't let anybody use your life experiences to rob you of your realities in Christ. Somebody said, but what about a child of God going through problems? You're going through problems because you're a human being. Even Jesus, when he was on earth, had problems. There were times they had to look for food. There were times he was in the boat and there was a storm. He had to stand up and rebuke it. 
Because all humans will have challenges here and there. That's why the Bible says, no temptation has taken you, but such as is common to man. And God is faithful. He will not allow you to be tempted above what you're able to handle, and he will with the temptation make a way of escape. The Bible says, I many are the afflictions of the tomorrow. righteous, but the Lord delivered him out of them all. So everybody goes through challenges. That doesn't mean you're possessed. You just need to trust God for wisdom, for direction, to come out of those challenges. And the Bible tells us, in the world you shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. So deliverance for a believer is a scam. Salvation is the only deliverance that a child of God needs. And knowledge, which is the renewing of the mind. Supposed to, to, to follow is uh, the, performing these uh, miracles, demonstrations, uh, prof prophecies, uh, the deliverance, or you say casting out of demons. Are these not the signs that are supposed to follow? Um, okay, you say everybody who is in Christ is supposed uh, to do that. I want to also look at uh, the transactional uh, theory that you keep talking about in the gospel. Uh, when you say it's transactional, what, what, what do you mean? Are you saying that um, it is no longer freely you received, freely you should give out? Uh, is, 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 is that where the problem is? The transactional gospel is a gospel where you bribe God. You have to pay for God to answer your prayer. You have to tap for God to give you anointing. It's all about money. You give to get, you give to get, you give to get. You want God to do something, you sow some money. You want God to answer your prayer, you sow some money. You want God to do something for you, you have to drop money. The way tell your money, the way tell your miracle. That is a transactional gospel and it's fraud. The gospel of Christ is free. Everything that comes from Jesus is free. Romans 8, 32. He that spared not his son, but gave him up for us all. How shall he not also with him freely give us all things? Jesus told the disciples, freely you have received from God. Freely give. Any miracle you pay for is not from Jesus. Any miracle you have to pay for, any breakthrough you have to pay for is not from Jesus. And don't forget, miracles are not exclusive to Christianity. There are soothsayers. There are diviners. There are other ways miracles are done. It's not exclusive. So miracles are not a validation of God in a man's life. The validation of God in a man's life is the scriptures, the gospel, the gospel of Christ. That is how you check whether it is God or not. Not that transactionary wicked gospel where they give people an impression like God is such a wicked father. If you don't give him money, he will not give you something. The Bible says, if you that are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children. How much for your father? There's no biological father that will wait for a child to give him money before he pays the school fees. Then what is the point? If we human beings are not like that, how will God be a God that will not answer prayer? He will not do anything till you pay. That gospel is a wicked gospel. It paints our God in a very bad light. And we must all rise up and attack that gospel and stop it because it is in no way the gospel of Christ. Um, are we saying that uh, the church should not be rich? Should our men of God not live in good, um, in good, uh, in, in affluence? Are they not supposed to write because living in very uh, nice houses? Is the church not supposed to look uh, so good if we don't want um, the tithes, the offerings, and others to be given to the church? Mr. Leonard, can you hear me? Yes, I can get you. I can get okay, you. Okay, so, well, there's nothing wrong in a pastor driving a big car, owning a good house, if that money is coming from his investment, his businesses, or his career. But a pastor must not oppress church members and use church members to live a life of affluence. No, you don't do that. What does the Bible teach? The Bible teaches that what God expects is that in food and raiment, let us deal with be content. Having food and raiment, let us deal with be content. So if a pastor is pastoring a church and the church is providing for the pastor to eat and to wear clothes and, and, and be a bit comfortable, that is enough. But if a pastor is not satisfied with that, he wants to fly jets, he wants to, then he by all means must get a business, start an investment, do something. After all, the apostles of Jesus were all doing businesses. Apostle Paul, who wrote half of the New Testament, was a tent maker. 
There's nothing wrong in a man of God doing business and having a career. In fact, it even helps you to be able to support the same ministry you're doing. There's nothing wrong with that. But don't oppress people and use means to extort them to live a flamboyant life where they themselves are managing to live. That is wickedness. That is wickedness. But God is not against a pastor living luxurious. If the pastor can afford it, there's nothing wrong with that. But not at the expense of the members who are struggling to survive and is oppressing them and being wicked over those members. It is not a good thing at all. It's not scripture. And there is no blessing for that. Okay, there is no blessing for that. Uh, so, so many messages. I hope I can. Uh, we can even uh, touch half of them. What will be the advice to young people of this age who are confused and scared about what's going on with Christianity, especially in Africa? Um, do you also are you also worried about uh, the, the, the 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 fate of Christianity in Africa? I'm worried, and that's why I'm shouting the way I'm shouting. And the reason why it's like that is because the true gospel has not been preached. A lot of African preachers are not preaching the gospel of Christ. They are preaching African tradition mixed with the Bible. And there's no power in that. Some of them are preaching the materialistic gospel, which is very loud all over Africa. And that has disenchanted people away from God. It has driven people away from the church. And the Bible says, when you start preaching that materialistic gospel, you will destroy the faith of many. And that's what's happening. That's why a lot of young people don't go to church. In fact, Mr. Leonard, let me be honest with you. If you know the thousands of emails that are coming to my office from people who left church, who were tired of church, tired of religion, tired of materialistic gospel, you will be alarmed. It's serious. All over Africa. All over Africa. Now we have to start counseling. We have to start doing discipleship classes all over the place for these people. People that have not been to church for 20 years, 5 years, 10 years, they are reaching out to us. You need to see the emails I'm having, even from a broadcast I did last night. I did one broadcast last night. The emails are coming from all over the world. Please, where is your church? I want to hear Christ. That's all I'm looking for. I'm looking only for Christ. People are looking for Christ because Jesus is the desire of all nations. All men seek for Christ. But if preachers of the gospel shy away from the message of Christ just to be able to please some people or fit into some status quo, then they are not really serious about the gospel. Because the gospel of Christ will always bring persecution to you. But you must be persuaded to preach it. But when you preach it, it is the power of God unto salvation. But I'm excited because all over Africa and the world, a lot of young, young people are rising who are embracing the truth and they are growing in that knowledge. And it won't be long from now. Falsehood and deception will be afraid of the pulpit. Legalism will be afraid of the pulpit. The materialistic gospel will be swept out of the pulpit because Jesus is taking back his church and is taking the center stage to bring men to himself because he didn't die in vain. He died to fulfill his objective of saving mankind. Okay, uh, Lee Nango, great guest, uh, Mr. Liu, uh, to invite. He is the Martin Luther of our time. The show will okay. And the Edwin says, Hope Prophet Elijah is aware of it, Mr. Liu. Okay, that this one says, My mentor, Dr. Abel Damina, we love you. Okay, this one says, uh, Kindly ask Dr. Damina what triggered him to start preaching against prosperity. Uh, Prosperity preaching. I love his preachings. Uh, okay. Kind regards. I'm sure he answered that already. Um, so many persons are asking for clarifications on what has been done already. Um, why is it that uh, in his uh, hermetics he sounds more of a, a philosopher than a spiritual preacher, given that under certain circumstances might not ascertain? Uh, mysteries of faith okay this one says please ask him to really differentiate between culture and tradition and why the bible recognizes traditional marriage but it's against other traditions like death celebration and memorial service doctor can you help on this well again you know the bible the bible has a message the message of the bible is salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. That's basically the message of the Bible. So the Bible is, the fundamentals of the Christian faith is Christ died, he was buried on the third day, he rose again. 
Now, in marriage, the Bible does not, we don't have Christian marriage. I always say that. We don't have Christian marriage, but we have Christians in marriage because marriage is cultural. That is why in marriage, once you meet the parents of the girl and the parents of the man, and they meet all the requirements, they are already married. They only come to church to honor their pastor so he can speak a blessing since he's their spiritual father. That's basically it. But real marriage is cultural. But there are Christians in marriage. Just like that, there is no Christian business. But there are Christians in business. There is no Christian politics. But there are Christians in politics. You see that? So, whatever culture or society you belong, the Bible is not against it. It's only against it when the practices of that culture goes against the faith of Christ. Goes against the faith of Christ. That's where the issue is. You have to, you have to know where your loyalty is. If your loyalty is to Christ, then by all means, if a culture contradicts what Christ preached, you have to put it aside. That's the only difference in that context. Okay. Uh, good day to you guys in the studio, man of God. I'm Clinton from Yaoundé. I'm following a course on how to worship God in kingdom fellowship. I love your teachings. Uh, will to I would like to have uh, your contact. Please, please, can I have this man of God's number? What's up? I'm a member of Discipleship Fellowship uh, Yaoundé. Okay. Um, please, if you are watching me and you want to have their numbers, just get to me, write to me after the program. I'll share their numbers uh, with you. It may be a little bit difficult now. Good morning. I'm Collins watching you from Upstation. Bamenda, the program is interesting. Question, what do we do to identify a false or true pastor? Um, doctor is going to help you guys on that. Uh, good morning, Mr. Liu. I'm called Mama Chrissy. Please ask uh, the man of God what Matthew chapter 23, 23 sets. Okay. Uh, okay. I don't know. Um, he's going to answer. We are listening and watching you from Kumbu. Thank you for the program. Thank you very much. Uh, this one says... Uh, Moto John Erume is watching from Onispo in uh, Douala. Wingo Yvonne is watching us uh, from uh, Yaoundé. Good morning, Mr. Liu, and to your guest, Dr. De Damina. Thanks so much uh, for this interview. I'm learning a lot. Ngala Denis is writing from Sombo. Uh, okay. Greetings. This is Breeze from Yaoundé. Please, Dr. Abel Damina. This in Cameroon, a good number of people believe there is no God nor Christ that we have to pray to our ancestors not in the white man of god okay uh, that is uh, what you think shalom john is watching from your only my question john your question is not there uh good morning sir i thank god for this topic for today it's alan noel from nigeria onicha but a cameroonian my problem is this uh, what's the difference between tithing in old testament and tithing in the new testament please help me out I'm waiting for your reply. I'm not sure there is a difference here. He answered that already. Chief Meta is watching from Bangem. That's in Kupe Morning Guba Division. Uh, good morning. It's Promise watching us uh, from uh, Yaoundé. Good morning, Mr. Liu Ngo Kingsley. Been watching from Fumbot West Region. Okay, uh, so many persons are watching across uh, Cameroon this uh, morning. Um, Dr. Ebe uh, Damina, we are looking at the church and the christians the, the the gospel of grace is it being abused today god is merciful god is gracious he's um very uh, forgiving uh, at some i don't know how do we reconcile the fact that we know that god is merciful he's gracious and we find those who are supposed to be leading who are not uh, living up to what is expected of them i'm talking about a christ-like okay no i didn't hear the end of it you say the message of grace how do we please if you can the say message, the question the message, again, the, message, the message of grace uh god is merciful he's gracious and the message of grace is it being abused today well it is no, it is not abuse. The abuse will only come from those who don't even know what the message is. Okay. What is the message of the grace of God? It is the message of Christ. Mm. That Christ is God's grace to us. Christ is the gift of God to us. But the problem many people have is 
they now out of mischief say that people who preach grace are given a license to sin but you cannot preach grace and give a license to sin because grace is the cure for sin the bible in romans chapter 5 says where sin abounds grace much more abounds then in chapter 6 verse 1 of romans he says what shall we say then shall we continue in sin that grace may abound then brother paul answered that rhetoric question god forbid then he says, how shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Know ye not that as many as were baptized into Christ, they were baptized into his death? So when you got born again, you were born into, you, you died to sin. You are now alive to God. And as you grow in the knowledge of Christ, you are being perfected. Your lifestyle, a transformation is taking place. An empowerment is taking place as you are being taught the word and you're growing but people that don't understand grace the bible says they will turn the grace of christ into lasciviousness like false brethren false converts who are not really born again or they just came among us and they are acting like us or legalistic preachers who are trying to preach grace without thorough training so instead of preaching grace they are preaching mixture they are preaching grace and law you hear them say things like grace to travel, grace to buy a car. There's nothing like that. You hear them say things like grace for open doors. There's nothing like that. Grace is Jesus. And Jesus is the grace of God to man in providing salvation from sin and a relationship with God Almighty. Yes, so there are those that abuse grace who don't even understand grace or who are mischievous or who have not been taught but they want to preach grace without proper teaching. So they are preaching it not according to the context of scripture. Just like it is with every other thing. There is always a people that try to malign and try to abuse it. But as we keep preaching the truth very loud, light will eventually overcome darkness and the truth will defeat falsehood. Uh, Dr. Ebe, uh, Damina, are you also aware that many persons uh, see the church in Africa today as contributing to uh, making many young people um, to be lazy, to not uh, venture into uh, so many aspects, waiting for miracles to happen, to turn their fortunes around. Is, has Christianity, to some extent, contributed uh, to where Africa is today? Yeah, that's true. That's true. God will not do for you what he has given you the ability to do for yourself. God never designed for people to live by miracles. God designed for people to live by principles. A miracle is an intervention of God when all principles fail. But people who just sit down and fold their hands and be fasting and praying for God to do what he has already given them the ability and capability to do. That's why there's so much backwardness. Because a lot of people spend their time fasting and praying in church. There's nothing wrong with fasting and prayer. It has its place. But also... Development of skills, accepting responsibility for the development of our continent, getting involved in the process, being a part of building our society, it is part of our civil rights. And nobody will do it for us. We have to stand up and do it. And it's important to start educating Africans. We have to take responsibility for our continent. We have to develop the skills. We have to go to school. We have to be exposed to all that we need. We have to develop the techn technological capabilities. We have to get involved in the political processes in our countries in installing governments that will bring development to our society so we can have good lives here on earth. That's not that, and that's what any civil society will do. That is why in societies where you find that they don't even know God, they don't care about God, you see a lot of development, which means God has given man the ability to develop his society and to give himself the kind of life he wants to live. That's very, very instructive. Okay. Um, now, you run campuses across uh, the uh, globe. Can we understand why? And not churches? Sorry, I didn't hear you, Mr. Leonard. I'm asking about the reason for running campuses across the world and not churches. Well, the reason why we call our churches campuses is because we don't want people who play church anymore. We want people that are serious about God. So we decided that we will call our branches campuses. So that when you're coming, you're coming with a student's mindset. You're coming to learn. 
what we do practically in our branches is Bible teaching. And that's what we do at the headquarters too. We just teach the Bible. We have Sunday school where we teach. We have the service where we teach. And then we engage in question and answers because that is actually the mainstay of the church. Teaching, teaching, teaching. So people are perfected to do the work of ministry. So that's why we call them campuses because it is a discipleship center. You know, in Matthew 28 verse 18, Jesus said, all authority is given to me. In verse 19, he says, go in therefore and teach all nations. Is the word matetio in the Greek. Matetio means go and turn men into students. Go and turn men into pupils. That is the great commission, to turn people into students. So our branches are called campuses because our target is to turn people into students who will keep learning Christ and grow and mature and do the work of ministry. Um, the more churches are created across almost every street in Nigeria, over there, like in Cameroon here, and in other African we have Yeah? Oh, yeah, Mr. Leona, we have campuses in Cameroon, we have campuses in Douala, in Yaoundé, in, in Bamenda, we have campuses in, I think, in um, Limbe, we have campuses all over that part of Cameroon. We have campuses in Nigeria, in Botswana, in Ghana, in, in, in Zimbabwe, Zambia, in South Africa, Lesotho. We have campuses in America, different states, in Canada, in the United Kingdom. I mean, we're all over the world. We have campuses all over the world. And we are raising men, we are training men, we are discipling men, we are equipping men and empowering them to serve God's purpose for their lives. And in Cameroon, they are, you know, we have campuses. And if people are interested, I can drop one or two phone numbers that they can call for further directions. And like many people who are trying to reach out to me, Mr. Leonard, I mean, you have my email address. If they email me their details, I will reach out to them. My email address is my name, drabeldamina at yahoo.com. D-R-A-B-E-L-D-A-M-I-N-A -E at yahoo.com. If people email me questions or whatever they want directions or they want help, we always I always respond to my mails. And there in Cameroon, we have campuses. You know, and if people call the numbers, they can get direction to our campuses. One of the numbers they can call is plus two three seven 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 two three one eight one. Plus two three seven 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 two three one eight one or plus two three seven six seven nine five one three eight six three plus two three seven six seven nine five one three eight six three or if you try and can't get anything reach mr leonard mr leonard will know how to find us and how to connect you to us okay are uh, you also are you also uh, very okay the email has been uh, put out there if you are watching the program you can just write to him using that email that is on our screen That's right. right now um but are you also right. are you also worried that um, we have churches almost everywhere yet the crime waves uh, rate of fornication almost everything is uh, going down the drain what is not working is it a message that is not going or is the wrong message that has been preached this far it's the wrong message that has been preached. The prosperity gospel does not allow people to grow spiritually. And until the church goes back, until the church goes back and press the restart button and begin to train people to study and to learn Christ and to grow in his knowledge, we will not see the glory of God manifest like it is supposed to manifest. That is where the issue is. Once the diet is wrong, the product will be wrong. So the diet is the issue. What are people hearing in churches? What are pastors preaching? Because that is what will determine the transformation of men, which will result in the transformation of societies. Okay. Um, now, with, with, with what is happening, are you already partnering with some persons who are doing um, the type, who are preaching the type of message that you are doing? Because so many persons uh, see you as um, uh, someone who has come to preach a message that is contrary to what uh, they preach uh, today. Are you guy? Are there some other men of God that are walking along your path? So, um, who that who, who also inspired you? Are there some 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 renowned men of God that preach the gospel that you now preach? Oh yeah, I'm partnering with a number of them. Some of them are my seniors in ministry. 
Some of them are my age group in ministry. Some of them are my genius in ministry. And we are training a lot of young, young pastors. We are training them all over the world. I have a ministerial fellowship called the Abel Damina Ministerial Equipping Network, where we are training and training men. And we have a Bible school that starts from July the 1st to July the, 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 the to August the 4th. It's an intensive Bible school here in Nigeria. And people come from, from Cameroon, from all over Africa and around the world to stay with me for one month. We teach and teach, answer their questions, equip them so they can do ministry. So yes, there is a collaboration going on around the world where we're helping people to come to a full realization of the message and we're empowering people to preach the same in the nations of the earth. Is it, is it um, a bad thing to, to observe that men of God now do competition as to who is the biggest, uh, who is better bless, blessed uh, based on what they have acquired, what they now do, best, based on uh, the crowd, the pool? Is it, is, it, is it good for the kingdom? Once Christ is not the focus, that's what produces all those competitions then the priorities will be wrong. You start defining ministerial success by crowd, by money, by car, by clothes. All that is carnality, Canali total carnality. That's why the Bible says that you, you should judge nothing before the time. Until that day when Jesus comes, who shall try the motives of every man's heart, and then shall we have praise of God. It is too early now to start checking who is the greatest man of God, who is the biggest. It's too early. It is Jesus that will do that for us at the judgment seat. It is not the crowd that determines whether the church is a, the man of God is a great man. After all, secular people are having crowds. I mean, you can imagine people, a stadium sparked by Michael Jackson, stadium sparked by, you know, all these secular people. Gathering crowd is not a sign of divine approval. It's not at all. Money is not a sign. The sign that you are with God is the message. That's why at the end of Paul's ministry, he said, I have fought a good fight. I have kept the message. He didn't say I have kept the crowd. He said, I have kept the message. And because I am true to the message, henceforth is laid for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord shall give to me and to those that love his appearing. So all those are not the yardstick. But when people don't know the message, they will make carnal things in the yardstick for ministerial success. Again, it's back to the content. What is the message? Because that is where the rubber meets the road. Okay. Um, we have to end at this uh, juncture because a program is coming up. Unfortunately, we started uh, the program uh, late. We hope that uh, we program another occasion to continue this discussion, Doctor. Thank you, Mr. Leonard. I'm, I'm so honored. Thank you for giving me the platform. But let me use the opportunity, Mr. Leonard, to announce my conference. My 30 days conference starts from this Sunday, Sunday the 30th of June to August the 4th. I'm teaching every day on my social media handles, YouTube, Facebook, and Instagram. You can watch me. My YouTube handle is Abel Damina Ministries International. My Facebook handle is at Abel Damina. No title, just Abel Damina. My Instagram handle is at Abel Damina. And then we have a free-to-air channel. It's called Kingdom Life Network on Strong Decoder. And then the programs will be aired on DSTV, channel 189, Pop Central TV. I'm preaching every Sunday, 8 a.m. GMT plus 1 and 11 a.m. GMT plus 1. Then Monday to Friday, 6 p.m. each evening, Monday to Friday, throughout till August the 4th. Now, I'm going to challenge you, if you follow me through this series of Soteria Season 11, we'll be examining the character of God in salvation. We're going to be examining the misunderstood God across the pages of Scripture. Tell your friends to tell their friends to tell their friends. It's going to be a study that you will be glad you were a part of. Beginning from this Sunday, 8 a.m., 11 a.m., two services, then from Monday is 6 p.m. every evening on my YouTube channel, Facebook, and on all our platforms. I'm really looking forward to see millions of Cameroonians connected because we must shine the light all over Cameroon, all over. Jesus didn't die in vain. We must rise up and spread the good news of the gospel 
across the nation of Cameroon. And I'm excited about this, Mr. Leonard. And I know your station will announce my broadcast that will be starting on your station, you know, uh, beginning from any moment from now. And I look forward to having a lot of testimonies as a result of the teaching of God. So once again, thank you, Mr. Leonard, for, for the platform. Thank you for having me today on your platform. Thank you uh, very much and to everyone who took time off to watch this edition of the program. Thank you to the production team. And uh, we can only say stay blessed. Bye-bye.